residential and propositions. 2024, here's a general overview of the pros and cons of both Donald J. Trump, former U.S. President Businessman and J.D. Vance, Senator from Ohio and author of Hillbilly Elegy, focusing on their political careers, policies, and public perceptions. Donald J. Trump. Pros, economic policies, Trump's administration saw significant tax cuts, particularly the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, which many supporters argue led to economic growth, lower unemployment rates pre-COVID, and stock market gains. Deregulation. His administration focused on rolling back regulations in areas like environmental protections and business rules, which many conservatives see as pro-business and crucial for economic growth. Foreign policy shifts. Trump pushed for America first policies, renegotiating trade deals like USMCA and focusing on national security with actions such as strengthening border controls and starting dialogue with North Korea. Populist appeal. His outsider status and plain spoken style resonated with many voters who felt disillusioned with the political establishment, especially in rural areas and among working class voters. Judicial appointments. He successfully appointed three conservative Supreme Court justices, which shifted the ideological balance of the court, affecting rulings on key issues like abortion and gun rights. Khan's polarizing figure, Trump's presidency was marked by deep political division. His rhetoric, especially on social media, was often viewed as inflammatory, contributing to increased polarization in American society. Handling of COVID-19. His administration's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic particularly his public downplaying of the virus's severity early on, was heavily criticized and is often seen as a negative aspect of his leadership. Impeachment and legal issues. Trump was impeached twice during his presidency, though acquitted both times, and is facing multiple legal challenges and indictments, including issues related to the January 6th Capitol riots and investigations into his business practices. Foreign relations and reputation. While some view his America First foreign policy as a strength, others argue it led to alienation from traditional allies and weakened international relationships. Election controversy. His refusal to concede the 2020 election and the events leading to the January 6th Capitol riot have left lasting concerns about his role in undermining confidence in the democratic process. J.D. Vance Prose, Working Class Advocate, Vance's background, as depicted in his memoir, Hillbilly Elegy, has made him a relatable figure to working class Americans, especially those in Appalachia and Rust Belt areas. His understanding of the struggles in these regions resonates with many who feel overlooked by the political elite. Conservative values. Vance supports conservative economic and social policies, including opposition to abortion and advocacy for traditional family structures, which align with many in the Republican base populist and anti-establishment. Like Trump, Vance has positioned himself as an outsider, critical of both the Republican establishment and liberal elites, which appeals to voters looking for change in Washington. Focus on Ohio and Midwestern issues. Vance has pledged to fight for the interests of Ohioans and the broader Midwest, particularly focusing on job creation, economic renewal, and combating the opioid crisis that has severely affected his home state. Cons flip-flopping on Trump. Vance was initially a strong critic of Trump, referring to him as cultural heroine in 2016. His shift in support for Trump during his Senate campaign has led to accusations of opportunism and inconsistency in his principles. Inexperience. Vance is a first-time senator, and while his outsider status is appealing to some, his lack of experience in elected office may be a concern for others looking for a more seasoned politician to represent their interests. Controversial remarks. Some of his comments and stances have sparked controversy, particularly regarding his views on culture wars and his criticism of American elites. While this helps him among populist voters, it alienates moderates and liberals. Ties to Peter Thiel. Vance has strong financial backing from tech billionaire Peter Thiel, which has raised questions about whether he might prioritize the interests of his wealthy backers over his working class supporters. Narrow appeal. While he has strong support among populist conservatives, some in the Republican Party view him as too extreme or as an opportunist, potentially limiting his broader appeal. Summer Donald Trump is a highly experienced yet divisive figure 
with strong support from conservative populists, but facing significant criticism for his leadership style, handling of crises, and legal issues. J.D. Vance offers a more and more intellectual and narrative-driven approach to populist conservatism, drawing from his personal experiences, but his political evolution and inexperience may raise concerns for some voters. Their pros and cons reflect the broader division between more traditional Republican figures and populist anti-establishment candidates. Here's a comparison of the pros and cons for Kamala D. Harris, current U.S. Vice President and former U.S. Senator, and Tim Walz, current Governor of Minnesota, based on their political careers, policies, and public perceptions. Kamala D. Harris. Pros, historic figure, Harris is the first female, first Black, and first South Asian Vice President, making her a groundbreaking figure in U.S. politics and a symbol of diversity and representation. Legal expertise, as a former Attorney General of California and U.S., Senator Harris has a strong legal background, which has shaped her approach to policy, particularly in areas like criminal justice reform and law enforcement oversight. Support for progressive causes. Harris has been a strong advocate for progressive policies, such as expanding health care access, climate change action, supporting the Green New Deal, and social justice reforms, appealing to liberal voters. Strong debate and communication skills. Harris gained recognition for her sharp questioning and debate performance, particularly during Senate hearings and the Democratic primary debates. Experience on the national stage. As vice president, Harris has been part of key policy discussions, particularly around the COVID-19 response, infrastructure, and foreign relations, giving her valuable experience in national and international governance. Cons, perception of inconsistency. Some critics argue that Harris has shifted her positions on key issues, particularly regarding criminal justice. As California's attorney general, she had a mixed record on progressive reforms, which has caused tension with some on the left. Limited policy achievements as VP. While she holds the office of vice president, her policy impact has been somewhat limited. Critics argue that she has struggled to define her role or make substantial legislative contributions during her time in office. Mixed public approval. Harris has struggled with approval ratings, with some viewing her as too progressive, while others believe she has not been progressive enough on issues like police reform and immigration. Challenges in handling key assignments. Harris was tasked with handling complex issues like immigration reform, particularly the root causes of migration from Central America, but progress has been slow, leading to criticism of her leadership in these areas. Polarizing figure. Like many prominent political figures, Harris is polarizing, with significant opposition from conservative voters who view her as too far left on social issues, immigration, and health care. Tim Wall's pros, moderate. Democrat Walls is often seen as a more moderate Democrat focusing on pragmatic governance rather than ideologically driven policy. This appeals to centrist and swing voters in both his state and potentially on the national stage. Strong focus on education and health care. Walls has prioritized education, health care access, and job creation in his tenure as governor, aligning with key Democratic values but focusing on practical, localized solutions. Crisis management. As governor, Walls's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic in Minnesota was praised by some for balancing public health needs with economic considerations. He implemented policies to keep Minnesota's response effective and adaptable. Experience in the military and Congress. Walls is a former U.S. congressman and military veteran, giving him both legislative experience and a strong understanding of veterans' issues, national defense, and bipartisan negotiations. Bipartisan appeal. Walls has demonstrated an ability to work across party lines on various issues, particularly in areas like agriculture and rural development, which appeals to more moderate or rural voters who may feel overlooked by urban-centered policies. Cons, polarized reactions to COVID-19 policies. While his handling of the pandemic was praised by some, Walls also faced sharp criticism from conservatives and business owners who opposed lockdowns and public health restrictions limited national name recognition. Despite being a two-term governor, Walls is not as well known on the national stage as other Democratic figures. This could be a disadvantage in terms of building a broader political coalition or running for higher office. Perceived as too moderate by progressives, 
While his moderate stance helps him appeal to centrist voters, progressives may feel that Walls's policies are too incremental and insufficient to address systemic problems like climate change and inequality. Handling of George Floyd protests. Walls faced criticism from both sides regarding his handling of the protests following George Floyd's death in Minnesota. Some argued that he didn't do enough to control the unrest, while others felt his response was too heavy-handed. Rural and urban divide. Walls has had to balance the needs of urban Minnesota with the concerns of its rural population. His efforts have sometimes been criticized as favoring urban issues at the expense of rural areas, particularly in sectors like agriculture and natural resources. Summary, Kamala Harris brings national level experience and a historic barrier breaking role as vice president, but faces criticism for inconsistency on certain issues, as well as challenges in defining her policy impact. Tim Walls is seen as a pragmatic and moderate leader with strong bipartisan appeal and experience in crisis management, though he faces challenges in gaining broader national recognition and criticism for certain decisions during his governorship. Their differences largely revolve around their policy approach, Harris being more progressive, Walls being more moderate, and the scope of their political influence, Harris at the national and international level, Walls with a focus on state governance. The image you uploaded contains a portion of a U.S. election ballot for the president and vice president candidates. Here are the pros and cons for the listed candidates based on general political context and their public platforms as of 2024. Claudia de la Cruz, Peace and Freedom. Pros, advocates for social justice, workers' rights, and anti-imperialism. Strong focus on community-based activism and grassroots movements. Cons, limited name recognition and political experience on a national level. Peace and Freedom Party is relatively small, reducing the likelihood of gaining broad electoral support. Kamala D. Harris, Democratos, experienced as Vice President of the United States 2021 to 2025, strong track record in civil rights and criminal justice reform, advocates for progressive policies on health care, climate change, and racial equity. Cons, criticized for her past as a prosecutor, particularly regarding her handling of certain criminal justice issues, polarizing figure among some progressive Democrats and moderate voters. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., American Independent. Pros, known for his work as an environmental lawyer and advocate for vaccine safety. Appeals to voters who are skeptical of mainstream media and government. Cons, controversial stance on vaccines and public health, leading to criticism from medical experts. Splits the vote for independent candidates, reducing his chances of winning. Chase Oliver, Libertarian Pros, advocates for smaller government, individual freedoms, and less government intervention in the economy. Appeals to voters disillusioned with both major parties. Cons, libertarian candidates typically face challenges gaining mainstream support. Policies like minimal government oversight may not appeal to voters who prioritize social safety nets or environmental regulations. Jill Pros, strong advocate for environmental justice, climate action, and social equity. Experience as a perennial candidate for the Green Party with a dedicated voter base. Cons, criticized for potentially siphoning votes away from more viable progressive candidates. Green Party candidates historically perform poorly in national elections. Donald J. Trump, Republican pros, former president 2017-2021, with a strong and loyal voter base, advocates for tax cuts, deregulation, and conservative judicial appointments. Appeals to voters prioritizing nationalism, border security, and economic growth. Cons, highly polarizing figure due to his rhetoric, handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, and actions around the 2020 election. Legal controversies and indictments have raised concerns about his fitness for office. This is a general overview of some of the most widely discussed strengths and weaknesses of each candidate. Depending on your specific political views, the importance of these pros and cons may vary. The image you provided shows part of a ballot with a contest for the U.S. Senate with candidates Adam B. Schiff, Democrat, and Steve Garvey, Republican, listed. Here are some general pros and cons of voting for each candidate based on their party and background without diving into specific policies. Adam B. Schiff, Democratic Party. Pros, experienced politician. Schiff has extensive experience as a United States representative, which may translate into strong knowledge of how the legislative process works. 
known for his work on national security, intelligence, and impeachment inquiries, which may appeal to voters interested in transparency and governance, likely to align with progressive policies on social issues, healthcare, and climate change. Khan's partisan figure Schiff's prominent role in impeachment proceedings may polarize voters who are concerned about divisive politics. Some may view his policies as too liberal or out of touch with centrist or conservative views, especially on fiscal matters or defense. Steve Garvey, Republican Party. Pro's outsider appeal. As a former professional baseball player, Garvey may be seen as a political outsider, which can be attractive to voters tired of career politicians likely to support conservative policies on taxation, regulation, and defense, appealing to fiscally conservative and pro-business voters. Strong connection to sports and community, which may create a favorable public image and grassroots support. Cons. Lack of political experience. Garvey's background in professional sports may be seen as a disadvantage when it comes to navigating complex policy issues. Potential focus on name recognition rather than a detailed policy platform could leave some voters questioning his readiness for office. The second image shows candidates running for the U.S. House of Representatives in District 17 with Ro Khanna, Democrat, and Anita Chen, Republican, listed. Here's a general overview of the pros and cons for each candidate based on their party affiliation and background. Ro Khanna, Democratic Party. Pros, incumbent with experience. As a sitting U.S. Congressman, Khanna has experience working on legislation and policy, potentially offering continuity and knowledge of the district's needs. Strong focus on tech and innovation. Khanna is known for his advocacy for technology, innovation, and the future of work, particularly in Silicon Valley, which may appeal to voters in District 17. Progressive policies. He supports progressive policies like healthcare reform, environmental protections, and economic equity, which could appeal to voters looking for social justice and economic fairness. Cons. Progressive agenda may be polarizing. Some voters may find his progressive stance on healthcare, regulation, and social issues too left-leaning or out of step with more moderate or conservative views. Ties to Silicon Valley. His close association with the tech industry could be a drawback for those who are skeptical of big tech's influence on politics and society. Anita Chen. Pros, new voice. As an educator and entrepreneur, Chen may bring fresh perspectives to the table, focusing on education reform, economic policies, and small business development. Conservative values. Chen's alignment with the Republican Party may attract voters who prioritize conservative values such as limited government, lower taxes, and traditional family values. Focus on entrepreneurship. Her background as an entrepreneur could resonate with voters interested in job creation, deregulation, and business-friendly policies. Cons, lack of political experience. Without prior political office, Chen may face challenges in navigating the complexities of the legislative process. Potential for alignment with broader Republican policies, Voters who disagree with national-level Republican policies, such as on climate change or health care, may hesitate to support her candidacy. The third image shows candidates running for member of the State Assembly in District 26, with Patrick Ahrens and Tara Sri Krishnan listed. Both candidates are from the Democratic Party, so here's a general comparison of their backgrounds and potential pros and cons. Patrick Ahrens, Democratic Party. Pros, experience in education governance. As a governing board member of the Foothill De Anza Community College District, Aarons has direct experience with educational policy and managing educational institutions, which could appeal to voters concerned with education reform. Focus on community colleges. His background may indicate a strong commitment to higher education access and affordability, which is a priority for many voters. Familiarity with local issues. His work on the community college board likely means he has an understanding of the challenges faced by local education systems and communities. Cons, limited broader legislative experience. While experienced in education, Aarons may be less familiar with areas outside education policy, such as housing, healthcare, or the economy. Education-centric platform. For voters more focused on issues like the economy, public safety, or healthcare, Aaron's may not appear as well-rounded. Democratic Party. Pros. School board experience. As a school board member in Santa Clara County, 
Shri Krishnan has experience managing K-12 education issues, which may appeal to voters interested in improving public education for younger students. Potential for fresh ideas. Her background in education and as a board member could bring new approaches to governance, particularly in balancing public education with broader state issues. Strong local engagement. Her work on the school board indicates a connection with local issues and the community, which may resonate with voters looking for someone with a grassroots perspective. Cons, lack of statewide political experience. Similar to Aaron's, Sri Krishnan's experience is more localized, and she may need to prove her ability to handle broader legislative challenges beyond education. Education focus. Like her opponent, her experience is heavily rooted in education, which could be seen as a limitation for voters looking for leadership on other state-level issues like housing or infrastructure. Both candidates offer strong educational backgrounds, and voters may decide based on which level of education reform or personal background they prioritize. Let me know if you need further insights or more detailed information on their platforms. The fourth image shows a judicial election for the position of judge of the Superior Court Office No. 5 with two candidates, Johnine Linda Stebbins and Jay Boyarski. Both candidates currently work in the Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office, but in different roles. Here's a breakdown of the pros and cons for each candidate. Johnine Linda Stebbins. Pros. Experience as Deputy District Attorney. As a Deputy DA, Stebbins likely has substantial courtroom experience, particularly in prosecuting cases. This hands-on experience can be valuable when transitioning to a judicial role, as she would have direct knowledge of criminal law and legal procedures. Local knowledge. Her work in Santa Clara County suggests she is familiar with local laws and the community's needs, which could make her more attuned to local concerns. Cons may lack broader legal experience. If her career has focused primarily on prosecution, she may have limited experience with civil law or defense, which are also important areas for a judge to understand. Jay Boyarski, pro's higher ranking position. As the chief assistant district attorney, Boyarski likely has experience overseeing a broader range of cases and managing larger teams. This higher level of responsibility may indicate strong leadership skills and a good understanding of complex legal matters. Extensive legal experience. Boyarski has likely dealt with a wide array of criminal and administrative issues, giving him a comprehensive view of the law from multiple angles. Cons, less courtroom time. While Boyarski's role as a chief assistant DA is impressive, it may involve more administrative work and less time in the courtroom compared to a deputy DA, which could be seen as a disadvantage in terms of direct legal practice. Summary, both candidates have strong legal backgrounds in the district attorney's office, though their roles differ. Stebbins might be seen as having more direct on the ground courtroom experience, while Boyarski's higher ranking position might be more appealing to voters looking for a candidate with broader management and legal oversight experience. The fifth image shows candidates running for Santa Clara County Board of Education, Trustee Area 1. The two candidates listed are Grace H. Ma and Jessica Spizer. Here's a breakdown of the pros and cons of each candidate based on their roles and backgrounds. Grace H. Ma. Pros, incumbent experience. As a governing board member for the Santa Clara County Board of Education, Ma has experience in educational governance, which is a valuable asset for this position. Focus on educational policy. With her background in the Board of Education, Ma likely has a deep understanding of the educational challenges and needs of the county, and voters may appreciate her continuity in this role. Track record. Voters who are satisfied with the current direction of the Board of Education may see Ma as a reliable candidate to continue the policies and initiatives she has been part of. Cons. Long tenure could be seen as a drawback. While experience is often a pro, some voters may prefer new leadership or fresh ideas if they feel the board hasn't addressed certain issues effectively during Ma's tenure. May be viewed as part of the status quo. If voters are looking for change or innovation in how the Board of Education operates, Ma may be seen as more of an establishment figure. Jessica Spizer Pro's Fresh Perspective. As a school trustee and mother, Spicer may bring a new perspective to the board, especially from the viewpoint of a parent with direct engagement in the local school system. School trustee experience. 
While she doesn't have the same county level experience as Ma, her role as a school trustee indicates a good understanding of school governance at a local level, and she may be able to apply this experience to broader countywide issues. Potential focus on community engagement. As a mother and trustee, Spicer may resonate more with parents and families who are looking for someone to champion their specific needs and concerns in education. Cons, less countywide experience compared to Ma, Spicer may be less familiar with the broader scope of education issues at the county level. Her experience as a school trustee is valuable, but may not fully prepare her for the challenges of working on a larger board. New leadership risks. Voters who are satisfied with Ma's leadership may be hesitant to choose someone with less experience at the county level. Summary Grace H. Ma offers continuity and experience as an incumbent on the Santa Clara County Board of Education, while Jessica Spicer brings a fresh perspective and a focus on local school governance as a trustee and mother. Voters may decide based on whether they prefer experience and continuity, Ma, or fresh leadership and parent engagement, Spicer. The sixth image shows candidates running for mayor of the city of Sunnyvale, with two candidates listed, Russ Melton and Larry Klein. Here's a breakdown of the pros and cons for each candidate based on their positions and backgrounds. Russ Melton. Pros. Experience as a city council member. Melton's role as a council member likely provides him with first-hand experience in city governance and an understanding of local issues. His experience in making policy at the city level could be beneficial if elected as mayor. Potential for fresh leadership. Moving from a council member to mayor could bring new energy or perspectives to the role, offering an opportunity for change or new initiatives that address the evolving needs of Sunnyvale. Cons, less mayoral experience. Since Melton is currently a council member and not the incumbent mayor, he may have less executive level experience compared to his opponent in running a city. Limited track record as a leader. Voters may prefer a candidate with more demonstrated experience in leadership roles specific to citywide management, which may make it harder for Melton to stand out against an incumbent mayor. Larry Klein pros. Incumbent mayor, as the current mayor of Sunnyvale, Klein brings experience in leading the city and overseeing city operations. His understanding of the mayoral role and previous accomplishments in office could make him a safer choice for voters seeking continuity. Established leadership, Klein has already navigated city issues and crises during his tenure, which can provide voters with a sense of stability and proven leadership. Cons, status quo concerns. While his experience as mayor is a pro, some voters may feel that Klein represents the status quo and may prefer a new leader to bring fresh ideas or tackle unresolved issues in a different way. Potential voter fatigue. If voters are looking for change or feel that new leadership is needed, Klein's incumbency could work against him, especially if there are significant issues that haven't been addressed during his term. Summary, Russ Melton offers the potential for fresh leadership and new energy, while Larry Klein has the advantage of experience and continuity as the current mayor. Voters may choose based on whether they prioritize experienced steady leadership or are looking for someone with new perspectives and ideas, Melton. The seventh image shows candidates running for member of City Council District 2 with Jim Davis and Elisa Cisneros as the candidates. Here's a breakdown of the pros and cons of each candidate. Jim Davis. Pros, government consultant experience. As a government consultant, Davis likely has experience advising and working on public sector projects, giving him insight into government operations and policies. This expertise could help him identify and implement effective solutions to local government challenges. Potential for fresh ideas. Since he's not the incumbent, Davis could bring new ideas and perspectives to the city council, which may appeal to voters looking for change or a different approach to handling local issues. Cons, no direct experience as a council member. While Davis has experience as a government consultant, he may lack the hands-on day-to-day -day experience that comes from being directly involved in city council work. Voters might prefer someone with direct local governance experience. Unknown track record in local politics. Without a history of service on the city council, some voters may find it hard to gauge how effective or aligned Davis is with the community's needs. Pros, incumbent experience, 
As the current council member for District 2, Cisneros has the advantage of experience. She is likely familiar with ongoing city issues and the needs of her district, which may make her more effective at following through on initiatives. Proven track record. Voters satisfied with her leadership will view her as a safe and reliable option. Her incumbency suggests she has already demonstrated her capabilities to some extent in managing local issues. Cons, status quo concerns. Some voters may feel that Cisneros represents the status quo, and if they are looking for change or new approaches, they may be more inclined to support a challenger. Potential complacency. As the incumbent, there's always the risk that an elected official may be less open to bold new changes, particularly if they feel comfortable in their role. Summary, Jim Davis offers the potential for fresh perspectives and expertise from his work as a government consultant, while Elisa Cisneros has the advantage of experience as the incumbent council member. Voters may decide based on whether they prefer a proven track record Cisneros or are seeking new ideas and change, Davis. The image you provided shows candidates running for director of El Camino Healthcare District. There are four candidates listed, Lynette Lee Eng, Julia E. Miller, Carol Ann Somersill, and John Zoglin. Here's an overview of the general pros and cons for each candidate based on their titles and background information provided. One, Lynette Lee Eng. Current role, council member senior liaison. Pros, political experience, Eng's experience as a council member likely gives her a strong understanding of public governance and community needs, which can be beneficial for healthcare district management. Leadership skills. Being a senior liaison implies she may have experience in negotiating between different groups and navigating complex governance challenges, important for running a healthcare district. Cons. Less healthcare specific background, while Eng has political and governance experience, her expertise doesn't appear to be healthcare specific, which may be a concern for voters seeking a candidate with a direct focus on healthcare administration. Potential divided focus. Eng's other roles as a council member may mean she has to split her focus between multiple governance responsibilities. Two, Julia E. Miller. Current role director, El Camino Healthcare District. Pros, incumbent experience. Miller is already serving as a director for El Camino Healthcare District, which gives her direct experience with the operations and challenges of running the healthcare district. Proven track record. Voters satisfied with the direction of the healthcare district during her tenure may feel confident in her ability to continue making improvements. Cons, status quo candidate. Some voters may feel that as the incumbent, Miller represents the status quo, and they may seek new leadership or fresh ideas for the healthcare district. Potential for stagnation. If voters are looking for significant changes or reforms in the district, they may be concerned that Miller's reelection will continue the same approach without substantial innovation. Three. Carol Ann Somersill, current role physician. Pros, healthcare expertise. As a physician, Somersill has direct knowledge and experience in the medical field, which could be highly beneficial in decision-making for the healthcare district. Focus on patient care. With her background as a doctor, Somersill is likely to prioritize patient care and healthcare quality, which may appeal to voters looking for more medical expertise in leadership. Cons. Potential lack of governance experience. While her medical experience is a major asset, she may lack the governance or administrative experience necessary to navigate the broader fiscal and operational responsibilities of running a healthcare district. Limited public service background. <laughs> Compared to other candidates with political or administrative backgrounds, Somersill may have fewer connections to community governance or public administration. For John Zoglin. Current role, Director El Camino Healthcare District. Pros, incumbent experience, like Julia Miller, Zoglin also serves as a director for the El Camino Healthcare District, meaning he has experience with the district's operations and its challenges. Continuity and familiarity. Voters who are satisfied with the current leadership may see Zoglin's re-election as a way to maintain continuity in the district's leadership and policies. Cons, status quo perception. As an incumbent, Zoglin may be seen as part of the existing leadership structure, which could be a downside if voters are looking for change or fresh approaches to healthcare management. Limited medical background. While he has experience in the healthcare district, 
Zoglin's background isn't specified as being in medicine, which could be seen as a drawback compared to candidates with direct healthcare experience, like Somersill. Summary, Lynette Lee Eng brings governance and leadership experience, but lacks a specific healthcare background. Julia E. Miller offers experience as the incumbent with a track record in the district, but may be seen as representing the status quo. Carol Ann Somersill offers direct medical experience as a physician, which could be valuable for healthcare decision-making, though she may lack governance experience. John Zoglin provides continuity as another incumbent with experience in healthcare district leadership, but like Miller, he could be seen as part of the status quo. Voters may decide based on whether they prioritize healthcare expertise, Somersill, continuity, Miller, Zoglin, or governance experience. The image describes a ballot measure that authorizes bonds for public school and community college facilities. Specifically, it authorizes $10 billion in general obligation bonds for repair, upgrades, and construction of K-12 public schools, community colleges, and career technical education programs. It requires annual audits with a fiscal impact of about $500 million annually for 35 years to repay the bond. Here are the pros and cons of this measure based on the information provided. Pros, improvement of school facilities. The bond would provide much needed funds for repairing and upgrading facilities, improving health and safety conditions, and modernizing classrooms. This would benefit students and teachers by creating better learning environments. Support for career technical education. The funds will also support career technical education programs, which are important for students seeking vocational training and technical skills needed in today's workforce. Economic and job benefits. Infrastructure projects, such as school repairs and construction, can create jobs and stimulate the local economy by providing work for construction companies and contractors. Accountability. The requirement for annual audits helps ensure that the funds will be used responsibly and that taxpayers can see how their money is being spent. Broad support. The measure has the backing of key educational organizations, such as the California Teachers Association, the California School Nurses Organization, and the Community College League of California, which suggests that those directly involved in education see this as beneficial. Cons, cost to taxpayers. The measure will cost the state an estimated $500 million annually for 35 years, which will likely be paid through taxes or state budget allocations. Opponents argue that this is a long-term financial burden especially for future generations. Debt concerns. Critics, such as the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, often argue that bond measures increase public debt and that there are other ways to fund school improvements without relying on bonds which accrue interest over time. Potential inefficiencies. While the measure includes annual audits, opponents may worry about government inefficiencies, mismanagement, or that the funds may not be distributed equitably across all districts. Impact on other state programs, the annual $500 million could impact the state budget, potentially diverting funds from other critical areas, such as healthcare, housing, or transportation infrastructure. Summary supporters believe the bond will help improve educational facilities, enhance safety, support technical education, and benefit the economy by creating jobs. Opponents are concerned about the long-term costs, increased public debt, and the potential for mismanagement of the funds. Voters will need to weigh whether the benefits to schools and students outweigh the financial burden of repaying the bonds over the next 35 years. The image shows Proposition 3, a constitutional right to marriage amendment for California. This legislative constitutional amendment seeks to recognize the fundamental right to marry, regardless of sex or race, and remove language in the California Constitution that defines marriage as only between a man and a woman. The fiscal impact is stated to have no change in revenues or costs for state and local governments. Pros, equality and inclusivity. The measure removes outdated language that restricts marriage to being between a man and a woman, reinforcing California's commitment to marriage equality and ensuring that all individuals, regardless of gender or race, have the right to marry. Symbolic importance. While same-sex marriage is already legal nationwide following the Supreme Court's ruling in Obergefell v. Hodges, enshrining this right in the state constitution adds an extra layer of protection and sends a strong message in support of equal rights.
no fiscal impact. The proposition states that there will be no financial burden on state or local governments, making it a cost-neutral policy change. Broad support from civil rights organizations. Supporters include organizations such as Equality California, the Sierra Pacific Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and the Dolores Huerta Foundation, which suggests that the measure has significant backing from groups focused on human rights, social justice, and equality. Future-proofing civil rights. By embedding marriage equality in the state constitution, the amendment protects against potential future attempts to undermine or restrict same-sex marriages at the state level, particularly if there are changes in federal law or Supreme Court rulings. Cons, opposition from conservative groups, some religious and conservative organizations, such, such as the California Family Council and specific religious leaders, oppose the measure on the grounds that it contradicts their belief that marriage should only be between a man and a woman. This could lead to ongoing cultural and political clashes in the state. Unnecessary amendment. Opponents may argue that this amendment is redundant, as marriage equality is already protected under federal law via the Supreme Court's ruling making the change to the state constitution less urgent or necessary. Potential for further polarization. Social issues like marriage equality often lead to intense debate and polarization, and some voters may view this proposition as reigniting cultural conflicts rather than focusing on other pressing issues, such as the economy, healthcare, or education. Religious freedom concerns. Some conservative groups may argue that expanding the constitutional definition of marriage could eventually lead to challenges against religious organizations that do not support same-sex marriages, potentially creating conflicts between equal rights and religious freedom. Summary supporters emphasize the importance of ensuring marriage equality is explicitly protected in the state constitution, which aligns with values of inclusivity and civil rights with no additional fiscal impact. Opponents are concerned about the implications for traditional definitions of marriage and the potential redundancy given existing federal protections. Voters will need to decide whether they view this as an essential step to protect marriage equality or an unnecessary change that could deepen divisions on social issues. The image shows Proposition 4, which authorizes bonds for safe drinking water, wildfire prevention, and protecting communities and natural lands from climate risks. This legislative statute would authorize $10 billion in general obligation bonds for these purposes. The fiscal impact is an estimated increase in state costs of about $400 million annually for 40 years to repay the bond. Pros addresses critical issues. The bond would provide significant funding for safe drinking water, wildfire prevention, and protecting natural lands from climate risks, which are all vital to California's environment and public health. Wildfire prevention. Given California's history of devastating wildfires, this bond could help improve fire prevention efforts and better protect communities from future wildfire risks. Water safety. Funding for safe drinking water is particularly important for communities that have faced water contamination issues, and this bond could improve water infrastructure and safety. Environmental protection. Supporters like the National Wildlife Federation and the Nature Conservancy argue that this measure will also help protect natural habitats, benefiting biodiversity, and preserving California's natural beauty. Job creation and economic boost. Infrastructure projects funded by this bond could create jobs and stimulate local economies through construction and maintenance work related to water systems and fire prevention measures. Support from key groups. The bond has the backing of organizations such as Clean Water Action and CAL FIRE firefighters, indicating support from environmental and public safety professionals. Cons, significant cost to taxpayers. The bond would cost the state around $400 million annually for 40 years, which critics argue is a large financial burden, particularly during times of economic uncertainty. Opponents, such as the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, often argue that bonds create long-term debt. Potential inefficiency. Critics may also argue that large government-funded projects can be prone to inefficiency, delays, and wasteful spending. Some may question whether the funds will be used effectively to address the intended issues. Alternative funding methods. 
Opponents might suggest that California should find other ways to fund these initiatives, such as reallocating existing funds or cutting costs in other areas, rather than taking on additional debt. Prioritization concerns. Some voters may feel that while drinking water and wildfire prevention are important, other issues like housing, health care, or education should be prioritized over climate-related spending. Lengthy repayment period. The 40-year repayment period could mean that future generations will be paying for the bond long after the initial projects are completed, raising concerns about long-term fiscal sustainability. Summary, supporters emphasize the importance of investing in clean drinking water, wildfire prevention, and climate protection, noting that these issues are urgent and affect public health and safety. Opponents are concerned about the high cost and long-term debt arguing that the state should consider alternative funding methods or that these projects may not be managed efficiently. Voters will need to weigh the benefits of addressing these environmental and public safety issues against the financial costs of taking on additional state debt. The image shows Proposition 6, which would eliminate the constitutional provision allowing involuntary servitude for incarcerated persons. This legislative constitutional amendment seeks to remove language in the California Constitution that allows jails and prisons to impose involuntary servitude, i.e. forcing incarcerated individuals to work as punishment for a crime. The fiscal impact notes that there could be an increase or decrease in state and local costs depending on the rule changes related to prison labor, but any financial effect likely wouldn't exceed tens of millions of dollars annually. Pros, abolishing involuntary servitude. This measure would remove language that some view as a remnant of slavery, aligning with the broader movement to ensure that all forms of forced labor are eliminated, even in prison settings. This can be seen as a critical step in promoting human rights and dignity for incarcerated individuals, promotes labor rights for prisoners, Removing this provision would give incarcerated individuals more control over whether they participate in labor while imprisoned. Those who oppose forced labor argue that prisoners should not be compelled to work under exploitative conditions and should be paid fairly if they choose to work. Aligns with modern criminal justice reform. There is growing public support for reforms in the criminal justice system that emphasize rehabilitation over punishment. Eliminating involuntary labor is seen as part of a broader effort to reform prison conditions and improve inmates' rights. Potentially improves conditions in prisons. By eliminating involuntary servitude, this could lead to better working conditions, wages, and treatment for incarcerated individuals who do choose to work, making the prison system more humane and just. Moral and ethical stance. Supporters like Assemblymember Lori Wilson argue that the elimination of this constitutional provision reflects California's commitment to justice and fairness in the treatment of all individuals, regardless of their incarceration status. Cons. Increased costs for prison systems. If involuntary servitude is removed, there may be increased costs to the prison system, as prisons may have to either pay prisoners for their labor or hire external workers to do tasks that inmates previously did. This could lead to higher operational costs for state and local governments. Potential loss of prison labor. Some argue that prison labor, while controversial, is essential to the functioning of prisons and allows inmates to learn skills that can be valuable upon release. Eliminating forced labor could reduce opportunities for inmates to gain job experience, though this argument depends on how the labor is structured and compensated. Risk of increased prison costs without clear benefits. Opponents could argue that the financial burden of eliminating involuntary labor is not justified, especially if the measure does not include clear provisions for how work programs will be replaced or what alternatives will be available for incarcerated individuals. No formal opposition filed. While there may be potential cons, the lack of formal opposition filings indicates that there may be limited organized resistance although some may still view this as a policy change that could have unintended financial or operational consequences. Summary supporters argue that Proposition 6 will eliminate a provision that allows forced labor, bringing California's prison system in line with modern human rights standards and furthering criminal justice reform efforts. Opponents, though none formally submitted, 
might argue that removing involuntary servitude could increase costs for the prison system and that there are concerns about how it could affect prison labor programs and prison operations. Voters will need to consider whether the moral and ethical implications of eliminating involuntary servitude for incarcerated persons outweigh potential costs or operational challenges in the prison system. The image shows Proposition 32, which would raise the minimum wage through an initiative statute. For employers with 26 or more employees, the minimum wage would increase to $17 immediately, to $18 on January 1, 2025, and to $18 on January 1, 2026. For smaller employers with 25 or fewer employees, the fiscal impact suggests that state and local government costs could either increase or decrease by up to hundreds of millions of dollars annually, with state and local revenues possibly decreasing by a few hundred million dollars annually. Pros improves living conditions for workers. Raising the minimum wage provides low-income workers with higher wages, which can help improve their quality of life, lift people out of poverty, and make basic needs like housing, food, and healthcare more affordable. Potential economic stimulus. When workers have more disposable income, they are likely to spend more, stimulating local economies. This could benefit businesses as increased consumer spending may lead to higher demand for goods and services. Inflation adjustment. Raising the minimum wage could help workers keep pace with inflation and the rising cost of living in California, where housing and other living expenses are particularly high. Reduces reliance on government assistance. A higher minimum wage could reduce the number of people relying on government welfare programs as individuals and families may be able to support themselves more fully on their wages. Addresses wage inequality. Proponents argue that increasing the minimum wage helps close the wage gap between low-income workers and higher-income earners, contributing to a more equitable economy. Cons, increased costs for businesses. Opponents like the California Chamber of Commerce, the California Restaurant Association, and the California Grocers Association argue that raising the minimum wage will increase labor costs for businesses, particularly small businesses, potentially forcing them to cut jobs, reduce hours, or even close down. Risk of job losses. Some economists argue that raising the minimum wage can lead to job losses, as businesses may hire fewer workers or automate tasks to reduce labor costs. This could particularly affect industries like retail and hospitality, which rely on lower wage workers. Increased prices. To offset the higher labor costs, businesses may increase the prices of goods and services, which could lead to inflation and a rise in the cost of living. This could diminish the purchasing power of the wage increase. Potential decrease in government revenues. The fiscal impact suggests that state and local revenues may decrease by a few hundred million dollars annually, as businesses' profitability could decline and lead to lower tax revenues. Additionally, increased costs for government employees could affect state and local budgets. Harm to small businesses. Smaller businesses, which often operate on thinner margins, may find it more difficult to absorb the increased labor costs compared to larger corporations. This could result in closures or reduced growth, particularly in industries like food services or retail. Summary supporters argue that raising the minimum wage will improve living conditions for low-wage workers, stimulate the economy, and address wage inequality, especially in high-cost areas like California. Opponents fear that it could lead to job losses, higher prices, and negatively impact small businesses and local economies, while also potentially reducing state and local tax revenues. Voters will need to balance the benefits to low-wage workers against the potential negative impacts on businesses and the economy. The image discusses Proposition 32, which proposes raising the minimum wage. The statute suggests that for employers with 26 or more employees, the minimum wage will increase to $17 immediately and then to $18 on January 1, 2025. For employers with 25 or fewer employees, the minimum wage would increase to $17 on January 1, 2025 and to $18 on January 1, 2026. The fiscal impact suggests that state and local government costs could either increase or decrease by hundreds of millions of dollars annually, while state and local revenues would likely decrease by no more than a few hundred million dollars annually. Pros, higher income for workers. 
Raising the minimum wage would immediately benefit low-wage workers, increasing their earnings, and potentially improving their quality of life. It helps ensure that workers can better keep pace with the rising cost of living, especially in high-cost areas like California. Economic stimulus. When low-income workers have more money to spend, they are likely to put it back into the local economy, boosting demand for goods and services. This can in turn stimulate economic growth and benefit local businesses. Potential to reduce poverty. A higher minimum wage could lift many workers out of poverty and reduce the reliance on government assistance programs such as food stamps and housing subsidies. Supports wage equity. This measure helps address wage inequality as it particularly benefits women and minority workers who are often overrepresented in low-wage positions. Fiscal impact on welfare programs. Over time, with more people earning a living wage, there could be less need for state welfare programs, potentially saving money on social services. Cons, increased labor costs for businesses. Opponents like the California Chamber of Commerce, California Restaurant Association, and California Grocers Association argue that this measure would increase labor costs for businesses, which could lead to reduced profits, job cuts, or reduced hours for workers. Small businesses with tight margins might particularly struggle with the increased wage obligations. Job losses. Some economists argue that a significant increase in the minimum wage could lead to job losses, especially in industries like retail, hospitality, and food services, where many low-wage workers are employed. Employers may look for ways to automate jobs or cut back on staffing. Increased prices for goods and services. To cover the higher wage costs, businesses may raise prices, leading to inflation. This could reduce the purchasing power of the wage increase, especially for consumers who already struggle with high costs of living, impact on small businesses. Small businesses with fewer employees may find it particularly challenging to adjust to the wage increase. These businesses may face closure, relocation, or downsizing as a result. Potential decrease in government revenue. The fiscal impact notes that state and local governments may face a reduction in revenues due to decreased business profitability and higher unemployment rates, which could impact funding for public services. Summary. Supporters believe raising the minimum wage will improve living conditions for workers, reduce poverty, and stimulate the local economy. Opponents argue that it will increase labor costs for businesses, potentially leading to job losses, price increases, and reduced profitability, particularly for small businesses. Voters will have to weigh whether the benefits to workers and the potential economic stimulus outweigh the risks of job losses and financial strain on businesses. The image discusses Proposition 5, which allows local bonds for affordable housing and public infrastructure to be approved with 55% voter approval, rather than the current two-thirds requirement. This legislative constitutional amendment seeks to make it easier for local governments to fund housing for low- and middle-income Californians, as well as supportive housing and public infrastructure projects. Pros addresses affordable housing crisis. Proposition 5 makes it easier to approve funding for affordable housing projects, which could help address the significant housing shortages in California. This is especially important for low- and middle-income residents who are struggling with rising housing costs. Supports infrastructure improvements. In addition to affordable housing, the proposition would facilitate the funding of critical public infrastructure, which could include transportation, utilities, and other essential services. Lower voter threshold. By lowering the voter approval threshold to 55%, it becomes more feasible to pass bonds for housing and infrastructure, leading to quicker solutions to these ongoing problems. Support from key organizations. The measure is supported by groups like California Professional Firefighters, the League of Women Voters of California, and Habitat for Humanity California, indicating broad support from organizations concerned with public safety, housing, and community welfare. Potential job creation. Passing bonds for public works and housing could create jobs related to construction, maintenance, and development, providing an economic boost to local communities. Cons, increased local borrowing and debt. The fiscal impact indicates that the proposition would lead to increased local borrowing to fund these projects. The borrowed money would be repaid through higher property taxes, 
which could increase the financial burden on homeowners and businesses. Higher property taxes. Property owners would likely face higher taxes to repay the bonds. This could be a particular concern for those already struggling with California's high property tax rates or living on fixed incomes. Opposition from taxpayer associations. Groups like the California Taxpayers Association oppose the measure, citing concerns about increased public debt and the higher taxes that would follow. These groups argue that it is unfair to burden taxpayers with additional costs, particularly in times of economic uncertainty. Risk of inefficient spending. Critics may argue that lowering the voter threshold could lead to the approval of too many bond measures without sufficient oversight, resulting in inefficient or wasteful spending on projects that don't necessarily address the most urgent needs. Impact on housing prices. Some opponents might argue that while the measure is intended to make housing more affordable, the increased taxes necessary to fund the bonds could actually contribute to the rising cost of living, particularly for property owners. Summary. Supporters believe that Proposition 5 will provide much needed funding for affordable housing and infrastructure projects with a lower voter threshold allowing quicker solutions to housing shortages and infrastructure improvements. Opponents worry that the measure will increase local government debt and property, property taxes, placing a financial burden on homeowners and businesses, with concerns about how efficiently the funds will be used. Voters will need to weigh the potential benefits of affordable housing and infrastructure development against the possible consequences of increased borrowing and higher taxes. The image describes Proposition 33, which expands local government's authority to enact rent control on residential property by repealing the Costa Hawkins Rental Housing Act of 1995. This act currently limits local governments from enacting rent control for new tenants and restricts rent increases for existing tenants in certain residential properties. The fiscal impact suggests a reduction in local property tax revenues of at least tens of millions of dollars annually, likely due to the expansion of rent control in some communities. Pros, increased protection for renters, Proposition 33 would give local governments more power to enact rent control, protecting tenants from sharp rent increases, particularly in expensive housing markets like California's. This could help stabilize housing costs for renters, particularly low- and middle-income residents who are most vulnerable to housing insecurity. Helps prevent displacement. By controlling rent increases, this measure could help prevent the displacement of long-term residents, including families, elderly people, and low-income individuals who may otherwise be priced out of their homes due to rising rents. Local control and flexibility. The proposition allows individual cities and counties to make decisions about rent control that reflect local housing market conditions and needs, giving local governments more autonomy to address housing affordability issues. Support from key groups, Supporters include the California Nurses Association, the California Alliance for Retired Americans, and Tenants Together, indicating strong backing from labor, retiree, and tenant advocacy groups that prioritize affordable housing and economic stability for residents. Addresses housing affordability crisis. With the high cost of living in many parts of California, expanding rent control could be a tool to help combat the state's ongoing housing affordability crisis particularly in urban areas where rents have skyrocketed. Cons, reduced property tax revenues. The fiscal impact suggests that Proposition 33 could lead to a reduction in local property tax revenues by tens of millions of dollars annually, as rent-controlled properties may be less valuable in the eyes of property owners and investors. This reduction in revenue could affect funding for essential local services, such as education, public safety, and infrastructure. Potential for reduced housing supply. Opponents, including the California Council for Affordable Housing and the California Chamber of Commerce, argue that expanding rent control could discourage new housing construction and maintenance, as developers and property owners may find it less profitable to build or maintain rental properties under strict rent control laws. Market distortions. Critics argue that rent control can create distortions in the housing market where landlords may raise rents as high as possible before rent control kicks in, 
or they may convert rental units into condos to avoid the regulations, further reducing the availability of affordable rental units. Limited benefits to new renters. While rent control can protect existing tenants from sharp rent increases, it does little to help new renters entering the market, who may still face high rental costs if the number of available rental units shrinks. Unintended consequences. Some critics argue that rent control could lead to poorly maintained buildings, as landlords might reduce investments in property maintenance due to limits on rental income, resulting in lower quality housing for tenants. Summary. Supporters believe that expanding rent control will help protect vulnerable renters from rising housing costs, prevent displacement, and give local governments the tools to address housing affordability in their communities. Opponents are concerned that this measure will reduce property tax revenues, discourage new housing construction, and create market distortions that could exacerbate housing shortages. Voters will need to weigh whether they believe the potential benefits of expanded rent control for tenants outweigh the possible negative impacts on housing supply, property taxes, and the broader housing market. The image describes Proposition 34, which restricts the spending of prescription drug revenues by certain healthcare providers. This initiative statute requires certain providers to spend 98% of revenues from the federal discount prescription drug program on direct patient care. It also authorizes statewide negotiation of Medi-Cal drug prices. The fiscal impact indicates increased state costs, likely in the millions of dollars annually, to enforce new rules on certain healthcare entities. Affected entities would pay fees to cover these costs. Pros, increased focus on patient care. By mandating that 98% of revenues from the federal discount prescription drug program must be spent on direct patient care, the measure ensures that a greater share of healthcare spending benefits patients directly. This can improve the quality of care and reduce administrative overhead, transparency, and accountability. The measure introduces more oversight and requires healthcare providers to be transparent about how they use funds from the discount drug program. This can help ensure that healthcare organizations are using taxpayer funded discounts to directly benefit patients rather than increasing profits or covering administrative costs. Support from healthcare and patient advocacy groups, supporters such as the ALS Association, the California Chronic Care Coalition, and the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, argue that this measure will benefit patients with chronic illnesses who rely on affordable prescription drugs and improved healthcare services. Negotiation of Medi-Cal drug prices. By authorizing statewide negotiation of Medi-Cal drug prices, the measure could lead to lower prescription costs for patients covered by the Medi-Cal program, potentially saving both the state and patients money in the long term. Equitable use of resources. Ensuring that a large portion of drug-related revenues are reinvested into patient care may help address disparities in healthcare access and outcomes, particularly for vulnerable populations such as low-income individuals and people with chronic conditions. Cons, increased state costs. The fiscal impact suggests that enforcing the new rules could result in increased state costs, potentially in the millions of dollars annually. This could strain the state budget, requiring additional resources for oversight and compliance monitoring. Administrative burden for healthcare providers. The requirement to spend 98% of revenues on direct patient care may place additional administrative burdens on healthcare providers who would need to adjust their budgeting practices and comply with new reporting and spending regulations. Potential for reduced flexibility. Critics argue that by mandating such a high percentage of revenues to be spent on direct patient care, healthcare providers may lose flexibility in how they allocate funds. This could impact their ability to invest in other important areas, such as infrastructure, staff training, or administrative functions that support overall care delivery. Opposition from consumer and advocacy groups. Some groups, including the National Organization for Women, Consumer Watchdog, and the Coalition for Economic Survival, have expressed concerns that the measure could have unintended consequences, such as reducing the availability of certain healthcare services or increasing costs for providers. Uncertain impact on drug prices. While the measure authorizes the negotiation of Medi-Cal drug prices, 
it's unclear how effective this will be in practice. There is no guarantee that the negotiations will lead to significant cost reductions for the state or patients. Summary. Supporters argue that Proposition 34 will ensure more health care spending goes directly to patient care, improve transparency in how funds are used, and potentially lower drug prices for Medi-Cal patients. Opponents are concerned about increased state costs, reduced flexibility for health care providers, and potential unintended consequences that could affect service availability or provider operations. Voters will need to consider whether the potential benefits of increasing spending on patient care and lowering drug prices outweigh the administrative and financial challenges the measure could create for health care providers in the state. The image describes Proposition 35, which provides permanent funding for Medi-Cal health care services through an initiative statute. It makes permanent the existing tax on managed health care insurance plans providing revenues to pay for Medi-Cal health care services. The fiscal impact suggests short-term state costs between $1 billion and $2 billion annually to increase funding for certain health programs with a total funding increase between $2 billion and $5 billion annually. The long-term fiscal effects are unknown. PROS ensures stable funding for Medi-Cal services. By making the tax on managed health care insurance plans permanent, Proposition 35 provides a stable and predictable source of revenue for Medi-Cal, ensuring that critical health services for low-income individuals remain funded, expands healthcare access. The additional revenue generated by this tax can be used to expand healthcare services under Medi-Cal, potentially improving access to care for millions of low-income Californians who rely on Medi-Cal for their health needs. Addresses healthcare disparities. By providing more consistent funding for Medi-Cal, this measure could help reduce healthcare disparities, ensuring that vulnerable populations, including children, seniors, and low-income families, receive the care they need. Support from major health organizations. Supporters of the measure include Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and the American Academy of Pediatrics, CA indicating strong backing from organizations focused on reproductive health, maternal health, and child health care. Potential federal approval. If the federal government approves the tax structure, it would help leverage additional federal funding, maximizing the amount of revenue available to support Medi-Cal programs without solely relying on state resources. Cons, increased costs for managed care plans, some critics may argue that making the tax permanent could lead to increased costs for managed care insurance plans, which could potentially be passed on to consumers in the form of higher premiums or reduced coverage. Unknown long-term fiscal effects. While the short-term fiscal impacts are estimated, the long-term fiscal effects of making the tax permanent are unknown. This uncertainty could pose risks if the state's financial outlook changes in the future, potentially leading to funding gaps or adjustments. Impact on state budget flexibility. By dedicating revenue from the managed care tax to Medi-Cal, Proposition 35 could limit the state's budget flexibility, making it more difficult to allocate resources to other pressing needs, such as education, infrastructure, or housing. Opposition concerns not submitted. While no formal opposition was submitted, some critics may worry about the potential for higher health care costs or the effect on private insurance markets. In addition, some may believe that the state should explore alternative ways to fund Medi-Cal rather than relying on a permanent tax structure. Summary. Supporters argue that Proposition 35 will ensure permanent stable funding for Medi-Cal health care services, improving access to care for vulnerable populations and addressing health disparities in California. Critics may be concerned about potential increases in managed care costs, the unknown long-term fiscal impacts, and the effect on state budget flexibility. Voters will need to weigh the benefits of providing stable funding for health care services through Medi-Cal against potential concerns about increased costs and fiscal uncertainties. The image discusses Proposition 36, which allows felony charges and increases sentences for certain drug and theft crimes through an initiative statute. It allows felony charges for possessing certain drugs and for thefts under $950 if the defendant has two prior drug or theft convictions. The fiscal impact notes that state criminal justice costs 
could range from tens of millions to low hundreds of millions of dollars annually, with local criminal justice costs likely in the tens of millions of dollars annually. Pros, stricter penalties for repeat offenders. The measure targets repeat offenders who have been convicted of drug or theft crimes multiple times, allowing for more severe penalties, including felony charges. This could deter chronic offenders and provide a tougher response to those who repeatedly break the law. Public safety benefits. Supporters, such as Crime Victims United of California and the California District Attorneys Association, argue that increasing sentences for repeat offenders will enhance public safety by keeping habitual criminals off the streets and reducing the frequency of drug and theft-related crimes. Accountability for serious offenses. The proposition focuses on ensuring that individuals who continuously commit crimes face appropriate consequences, which could reduce the strain on communities impacted by drug and theft-related issues. Support from crime victim and justice organizations. Groups advocating for victims of crime and public safety, including crime survivors for safety and justice, support the measure, reflecting the desire for more stringent sentencing to protect communities from repeat offenders. Cons, increased costs for the criminal justice system. The fiscal impact highlights that implementing this measure could significantly increase costs for both state and local governments. The additional costs of prosecuting more cases as felonies and incarcerating offenders for longer periods could place a financial burden on the justice system, which is already dealing with resource limitations. Potential for prison overcrowding, felony charges and increased sentences could contribute to prison overcrowding as more offenders would face longer sentences. This could exacerbate existing problems in California's prison system, leading to higher incarceration rates and associated costs. Focus on punitive measures. Opponents, including Diana Becton, District Attorney of Contra Costa County, argue that increasing sentences for drug and theft crimes focuses too much on punitive measures rather than addressing the root causes of these offenses, such as addiction, poverty, or lack of social services. They may prefer solutions, solutions focused on rehabilitation and treatment rather than incarceration. Disproportionate impact on marginalized communities. Critics may argue that increasing penalties for drug-related offenses disproportionately impacts marginalized and low-income communities, where individuals are more likely to face substance abuse issues and economic hardships. This could lead to higher incarceration rates for vulnerable populations without addressing the underlying causes of their behavior. Alternatives to incarceration. Many advocates for criminal justice reform argue that there are more effective ways to reduce crime, such as investing in rehabilitation programs, drug treatment, and mental health services, rather than increasing sentences and expanding the use of felonies. Summary. Supporters argue that Proposition 36 will increase public safety by imposing tougher penalties on repeat offenders, providing greater accountability for those who commit drug and theft crimes, and reducing the impact of repeat offenses on communities. Opponents are concerned about the high costs of implementation, the potential for prison overcrowding, and the focus on punitive rather than rehabilitative measures. They may prefer investment in alternatives to incarceration that address the root causes of these crimes. Voters will need to balance the potential public safety benefits against the financial and social costs of increasing sentences and felony charges for repeat offenders. The image discusses Measure E, the Sunnyvale Main Library measure, which proposes issuing $290,000 in bonds to provide residents with an accessible, modern, sustainable, and earthquake-safe library. The funds would be used to expand spaces for collections, events, and educational programs for children, teens, and seniors. The measure would also address deteriorating plumbing, electrical systems, and roofing. The bond would result in a maximum levy of $27.47 per $100,000 of assessed property value, generating approximately $18,600,000 annually while the bonds are outstanding. The measure includes provisions for audits, citizen oversight, and local use of funds. Pros, improved library facilities. The measure would provide funding to upgrade the Sunnyvale Main Library, making it more accessible, modern, and safe. 
This includes critical improvements to infrastructure, like plumbing, electrical systems, and roofing, which may be outdated or deteriorating. Enhanced community services. Expanding spaces for collections and educational programs would benefit a wide range of residents, including children, teens, and seniors. The library could offer more events and programs, promoting lifelong learning and community engagement. Earthquake safety. Making the library earthquake safe is a significant advantage as it ensures the building can withstand seismic activity and remain a safe resource for the community. Local economic benefit. The construction and upgrades may create local jobs and stimulate the economy. Additionally, the library's enhanced facilities could increase community activity and draw more residents to participate in local events. Accountability measures. The measure includes audits, citizen oversight, and a commitment to ensuring that all funds are used locally. This transparency could help build public trust in how the bond money is spent. Long-term investment. By making these investments now, the city could avoid more costly repairs or replacements in the future. A well-maintained library can serve as a valuable resource for generations. Cons. Increased property taxes. The bond measure would increase property taxes with a maximum levy of $27.47 cents per $100,000 of assessed property value. Some property owners may find this tax increase burdensome, particularly those on fixed incomes or already facing high living costs. Long-term financial commitment. The bond measure represents a long-term financial obligation for the city, with the bonds generating $18,600,000 annually while outstanding. Some voters may be concerned about taking on this level of debt, especially if there are concerns about future economic conditions or unforeseen financial challenges. Lack of formal support or opposition. While the measure includes no formal submissions of support or opposition, some voters might view this as a lack of clear guidance on the pros and cons, leading to uncertainty about the full impact of the measure. Alternative uses of funds. Critics might argue that the $290 million could be better spent on other priorities, such as housing, infrastructure, or public safety, rather than library improvements. There may be a debate over whether upgrading the library should be the city's top spending priority. Summary, supporters of the measure argue that it would improve the library's facilities, provide valuable community services, and ensure earthquake safety, with built-in accountability measures to ensure responsible use of funds. Opponents might be concerned about the increased property taxes, the long-term debt obligation, and whether the funds could be better used for other pressing community needs. Voters will need to consider whether the benefits of modernizing and improving the library outweigh the financial costs to property owners and the city. The image discusses Measure F, which proposes amendments to the Sunnyvale City Charter. The amendments include, one, eliminating the voter registration's citizenship requirement for members of all boards and commissions to remove barriers to volunteering, two, changing the required city council meeting frequency from two meetings per month to at least 24 meetings per year with no more than six weeks between meetings to provide more scheduling flexibility. And three, replacing gendered references throughout the charter with gender neutral language. Pros, removes barriers to volunteering. By eliminating the voter registration and citizenship requirement, Measure F could encourage more people to participate in boards and commissions, increasing diversity and inclusion. This change could make it easier for non-citizens or those not registered to vote to contribute to their community. Increases scheduling flexibility, changing the meeting schedule to 24 meetings per year with no more than six weeks between meetings could offer the city council greater flexibility. This would allow for adjustments based on workload, special circumstances, or holidays, making governance more adaptable. Promotes gender equality. Replacing gendered language in the city charter with gender neutral terms is a step toward inclusivity and equality. It ensures that the charter reflects modern values and the evolving understanding of gender identity. Encourages civic engagement. The proposed changes, particularly the removal of the voter registration requirement, could encourage more residents to get involved in city government, promoting civic engagement and representation. Cons. Concerns about non-citizen participation. 
Opponents may argue that allowing non-citizens or non-registered voters to serve on boards and commissions could lead to decisions being made by individuals who do not have a formal stake in local elections or civic processes, potentially raising concerns about representation and accountability. Reduced frequency of meetings. While the proposed meeting schedule allows for flexibility, some may argue that reducing the required frequency of meetings could slow down the city's decision-making processes. In situations where more frequent meetings are needed, this flexibility might result in delays. Opposition without formal support. The measure lists several opponents, including Stephen Scandalous, Carlene Nakagawa, Xiangyang Yao, Meiling Shek Stefan, and Fang Yang, but no formal support. The lack of formal support could make some voters skeptical about the necessity or benefits of the changes. Potential for less consistent oversight. If fewer city council meetings are held, there may be concerns about less frequent oversight and transparency. Opponents could argue that this could reduce public input and oversight of the city's actions. Summary supporters argue that Measure F will promote inclusivity and flexibility, remove barriers to volunteering, and modernize the language of the city charter, making it more inclusive of all genders. Opponents may raise concerns about allowing non-citizens or non-voters to serve on boards and commissions, the potential for reduced oversight with fewer meetings, and the lack of formal support for the measure. Voters will need to consider whether the proposed changes will improve civic participation and inclusivity without compromising representation and government transparency. The image discusses Measure Y, a proposal to renew annual funding for local elementary and middle schools in the Sunnyvale School District. The measure extends an existing $59 per parcel tax, which would provide $1 million annually for eight years to support academic programs without raising tax rates. The funds would support programs including math, English, science, and technology, attract and retain quality teachers, and keep class sizes small. The measure includes senior exemptions and all expenditures would be audited and reviewed by a community oversight committee with no funds going to administrators and all funds staying local. Pros, continued funding for education programs. Measure Y ensures that local schools will continue receiving critical funding for academic programs such as math, English, science, and technology without raising tax rates. This helps maintain the quality of education in the Sunnyvale School District, supports teachers and small class sizes. The measure allocates funds to help attract and retain quality teachers, which can improve student outcomes. It also helps keep class sizes small, allowing for more individualized attention and better learning environments for students. No increase in taxes. The measure extends an existing tax rather than creating a new one which means residents won't experience a tax increase. This makes it more palatable to taxpayers who want to support education, but may be concerned about higher costs. Senior exemptions. The measure includes exemptions for seniors, protecting those on fixed incomes from additional tax burdens while still providing funding for schools. Transparency and oversight. All expenditures will be audited and reviewed by a community oversight committee ensuring transparency in how the funds are used. This accountability helps reassure voters that the money will be spent responsibly and for its intended purposes. Funds stay local. The measure guarantees that all the money generated will stay in the local community directly benefiting Sunnyvale schools and students. Cons tax continuation. While the measure doesn't raise taxes, it continues an existing tax. Some property owners may be opposed to extending the parcel tax for another eight years, arguing that they already face significant tax burdens. Limited flexibility in spending. The measure specifies that none of the funds can go toward administrative costs, which some may see as too restrictive. School districts may need some flexibility to allocate resources to administrative functions that support education. Lack of formal opposition or debate, the image shows no formal opposition submitted, which could mean there has been limited public debate about potential drawbacks or concerns. Voters may wish for more information or discussion before deciding. Potential impact on property owners. While the parcel tax is relatively modest, some property owners might feel that even a small tax is burdensome, particularly in combination with other local and state taxes. Summary. Supporters argue that Measure Y will pro provide stable funding for essential academic programs, 
help attract and retain teachers, and keep class sizes small, all while maintaining transparency and without raising taxes. Opponents might be concerned about extending the parcel tax, the restrictions on how the funds can be used, and the impact on property owners. Voters will need to consider whether the benefits of continuing funding for Sunnyvale schools outweigh concerns about extending the parcel tax.